everyone and welcome to London Business School's webinar on making innovation happen. This webinar will be presented by Professor Julian Birkinshaw, who is a TEM Chair Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at London Business School. Professor Birkinshaw is also the Academic Director of the Making Innovation Happen program and leads the faculty team that is responsible for designing and delivering this program. Before we start, I would like to clarify that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you would like to send us your questions, please type them in the chat box that is located at the bottom of the screen. You will be able to do this throughout the whole webinar. We will try to reply to as many questions as possible. And if there are any that we missed during this webinar, then we will contact you after the event has concluded. Thank you very much for registering. And we hope that this webinar will spark your interest in making innovation happen. And with that, I will hand you over to Professor Birkinshaw. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all, uh, albeit virtually. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to spend about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, talking about some of the key uh, contemporary challenges in innovation. Most of you work in, in large companies, um, although I suspect some of you are in startups. This is particularly a, a conversation really about what, what innovation looks like in big organizations, why it's difficult, and what we can do to become better at it. Um, what I'm going to suggest as a sort of a, as a starting point is, is the following, which is that when you say innovation, most people gravitate towards a couple of assumptions. One assumption is that innovation is mostly about developing new products, developing new technologies. Some people think it's about uh, putting in place new processes. And of course, it, it is all of those things. But it's also a whole bunch of other stuff as well. And what this chart is trying to suggest is that you know, over and above the usual stuff about investing in new products and technologies, innovation also covers business model innovation, management model innovation, service innovation. All of these are different approaches to taking the tools of innovation and applying them to important issues. Uh, as a simple definition, you can think of innovation as the exploitation of new ideas. So if we develop a new way of servicing our customers, uh, selling them the same product but through a different service, that is service innovation. If we think in terms of changing the basic kind of dimensions on which we are putting our business in the marketplace, you know, think of that as, as, as business model innovation. IKEA is the classic example of that. Or you can think of a company like Google as a, as a management innovation, a company that is as interested in, in coming up with new ways of working internally as it is at coming up with new products or technology. So for me, the starting point in any conversation of innovation has to be that we are interested in all of these different types. And particularly, we are interested in the types that actually are the most difficult to do. And there's a sort of a logical flow from bottom to top here, whereby the, the higher order forms of innovation on this chart typically are the harder ones to do. But they're also the ones that if you get them right, offer the biggest sort of return on investment. They're the ones that give you a real competitive advantage. What this chart here tries to suggest is, is a very important conceptual point, which is that as we start thinking in terms of innovation as being how we work rather than the products or services we sell, it's actually possible to get a massive payoff from innovating in our methods of work. What this chart is, is showing, it's some data from a study done 15 years ago, whereby looking across a number of different US manufacturers, these researchers looked at cases where people had invested in information technology, put money into, into, into new technology, into new computer systems, new networking, and so forth. But they also looked into the extent to which they changed their workplace practices. In other words, rather than just computerizing existing processes, they'd actually rethought some of those processes, re-engineered them in order to make them work more effectively as well as more efficiently. And what this chart very, very simply shows is that the big payoff is from doing both. In other words, you know, if you're a company that's putting a lot of money into, into technology, you need to also think in terms of improving the practices that go with that, rethinking those practices in order to get a payoff from that technology. Because if you simply computerize your existing processes in their old fashioned way, all you get is essentially a big upfront investment and not as much of a payoff as if you really think creatively about what you could do differently. 
Now, where do innovations come from? What we're going to spend the next 10 minutes on in this and this webinar is really just to help you think creatively about your business, the products or services you sell, and to give you almost a couple of lenses, if you like, to to come up with with new solutions, new new ways of working, and so forth. Uh, what this little chart is trying to get at is is a is a very important point. You may recognise on the left hand side there uh, that is penicillin. Um, penicillin, of course, was invented by or discovered rather by Alexander Fleming, and he discovered it by accident. Uh, he discovered it because his petri dishes were left overnight unwashed, and there a, a, a mold grew on them, and he put the mold under his microscope, and that is where is the genesis of penicillin. On the right hand side, you see um, a, a burr, something you find in, a, find in a field as you walk through it, which sticks to you uh, because it's got these little hooks at the end of those little uh, on the ends there. Um, and it turned out that a Swiss inventor, Georges de Mistral, um, had this brainwave at some point, this is 30 years ago, where these things stuck to him. He looked at them and said to himself, How are they stuck to me? And he had the brainwave, which ultimately led to the creation of Velcro. And as you know, Velcro is a, you know, essentially is a means of sticking two things together using little hooks. So the point of both of these little stories is that an awful lot of innovation happens serendipitously. Now, if you're not a native English speaker, you do not know the word serendipity. It is one of those impossible words. I won't give you the background. It simply means to sort of to stumble upon as a happy accident. So innovation often happens serendipitously, by accident, you know, as a sort of a, a fortunate set of circumstances. But the key point here is that you have the sort of the uh, sort of the insight that leads you to kind of pursue and follow up on, on something that happens by accident, and you and you then turn it into a, an innovation. Now we can rely on people having these happy accidents, or if, particularly if we work in a large company, we can be a bit more systematic about innovation. And what I'm going to just throw out for, for general um, consumption, for interest, to help you uh, with your teams as you start thinking about new ideas, is three lenses that I've seen used by successful entrepreneurs, people like Richard Branson, uh, that help them get into a different frame of mind to help them come up with new business ideas, new products, and so forth. The three I'll identify here, what we'll do is we'll just spend a, a few minutes on each one. I'm not trying to suggest in any sense that this is an exhaustive set of ways that you can come up with new ideas. The whole point about creativity, of course, is that it can't be programmed. But he, behind each one of these lenses, you can imagine a kind of a structured discussion that you could have with your team to help them say, you know, what if we did this? What if we did that? So let me just introduce those three themes straight away. The first is this notion of tapping into unarticulated needs. Uh, and this is a kind of a a well-trodden path. Uh, sometimes it goes under the lens, under the um, heading of design thinking. Sometimes it's called ethnography. And I just like this quote from Steve Jobs. It's a, it's quite a nice way of getting at the point, which is when he was uh, first asked about the, uh, the the development of the iPhone, asked if he if he'd done any market research to develop it. His disparaging response was, "Well, did Alexander Graham Bell do any market research before inventing the telephone?" Jobs's view was that. You can't do market research on something which doesn't exist. In other words, rather than asking our customers what do they want, we are tapping into some sort of unmet or latent or unarticulated need that, that they have, that they need somebody with a dose of vision or creativity, like a, a Jobs or a Branson, to tell them this is what you want. Uh, and lo and behold, if you get it right, you know, the world beats a pathway to your door, if you see what I mean. So there are lots of techniques out there that people have played with to help tap into unarticulated needs. If you're in the world of marketing, for example, you definitely come across this notion of, of ethnography, this notion that you don't ask your customers what they want. You actually visit them in their homes. You actually watch them as they're using your existing products or services. You're trying to figure out what their what their unmet needs are by by observing the workarounds they use when using a product or service. You know, if you, I remember talking to some some folks who were were were, were developing a new financial services product, and they uh, apocryphally anyway they went into this this woman's home and she and they asked her about what savings project 
used in terms of perhaps thinking about selling a, a new financial services product. She took them into her kitchen, she opened her freezer, and she pulled out a, uh, a Tupperware tray with her credit card encased in a block of ice. And she said, this is my, this is my savings product. If I, if I get the urge to spend money, I take the, the, the block of ice out of the freezer, the block of ice melts, and a couple of hours later, my, my credit card is freed and I'm, I'm then free to, to spend money. But she says, usually after a couple of hours, the urge to spend has worn off. And, and I put the credit card back into the freezer and, and, I, and I refreeze it. Anyway, whether this is true or not doesn't really matter. It's a beautiful story. And it actually helped this company in question to, to think a bit more creatively about the, the fact that most of us want to save money, but most of us also have this sort of urge to spend occasionally and try to balance our sort of our saving and our spending mentalities was the way that they had of uh, of creating a, a new product in that in that genre and of course the argument is you couldn't have done that without going to that person's home and sort of seeing for yourself the issue so that's that's the first lens tapping into unarticulated leads the second we can call it challenging current orthodoxy every industry is sort of beholden to a set of rules or traditions that, that even the people operating in that industry aren't completely aware of. And what the imagery we've got here is trying to convey is, is a story about a, a, a relatively recent uh, hotel chain called Yota, founded by a, an entrepreneur called Simon Woodruff. Um, and he had the insight that, that one of the problems with traditional hotels is that they um, they operate according to, of course, a, a fixed sort of daily cycle. You know, you can't check into the hotel room before midday. You have to check out. You know, uh, so you can't check in before a certain time, typically four or five in the morning, in the afternoon. You have to check out by midday. And he said that's that makes sense if you care about, you know, operating the staff within the hotel. You want to have your cleaning cleaning people cleaning the rooms at a certain time. You want to have the checkout staff working at certain times of day. But he said that actually doesn't help the business traveler in, in the slightest. And he said to himself, you know, what we really need is a hotel which allows you to check in or check out according to your needs rather than the needs of the hotel staff. So he said to himself, why don't I create a hotel chain where people can actually essentially book the rooms by the hour? Now, these chains exist in other parts of the world. But what I'm, I think is, 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 is this really neat insight is that Business travelers very often will only want a hotel for three or four hours. Perhaps they get in on a long haul flight. They want to be able to check in, have a shower, have a bit of sleep, and then go off to a meeting. So he created this chain, and it, and it operates in a number of locations like Heathrow Airport in New York City and so forth. And you rent the rooms, you, you know, you hire the rooms, as it were, in four hour chunks. And so the point is that this business concept grew out of an insight that, that there were some orthodoxies, there were some standard ways of working in the industry that he kind of took on and inverted, he kind of turned them on his head. This is the way that the industry is working. Let us propose an alternative way of working as a way of thinking creatively. So, you know, an awful lot of companies can do this. Uh, what I would suggest you do is actually draw up that list of kind of standard practices, standard assumptions that everyone in your, in your industry makes and say to yourself, why? You know, why does it make sense? If you work in the airline industry, you know, why do we... Why do we have boarding passes? Well, these days, actually, we don't really need boarding passes anymore. You know, why do you have to check in so far in advance? Why do you have to stand in line waiting here and there? Why? All of these different things we kind of take for granted in the entire airline journey, all of these things can and should be challenged. And that's often the insight that leads to new business ideas. The third and final lens I'm just going to throw out there for, for fun at this stage is the idea that an awful lot of business ideas are simply begged, borrowed, or stolen from other contexts. I've got two little images up here. You know, one is uh, Ford's original assembly line. How did Henry Ford have the idea of creating an assembly line? Well, he had the idea because he, told, he stole the idea from the local slaughterhouse, the sort of the disassembly line, if you like, uh, where they'd already put in place an assembly line for, for chopping up dead, dead meat carcasses. So he had that idea by essentially seeing what was happening in other parts of the world. The image on the right is another of, of the uh, Simon Woodruff, the entrepreneur's innovations. It's a hotel chain called Yo Sushi. And I think if you travel to London, you've seen, you've seen that. It's a little conveyor belt with the sushi on it. It wasn't his idea. It was an idea he basically got by visiting Japan, seeing 
how people uh, offered sushi there and he took that idea and he brought it back to the UK and created a business out of it. An awful lot, in fact arguably most new business ideas are actually business ideas that we have taken and adapted from other contexts. And of course the reason that's useful is that it gives us license to spend time talking to people from often from very different industries, going on travel, business trips to other countries, to see what works there. You don't have to be a genius to be an entrepreneur. You just have to have the, the foresight that says, here's something I've seen working in one place. Would that work in another place if I just made, made a little adaptation to it? So that's the three lenses. And of course, what I've done in these last 10 or 15 minutes is really just give you a few thoughts about where new business ideas come from. And one of the themes of this course that we are promoting here, which will run next in June, is really to try to, to give you a way of, of looking at the world differently to help you to generate ideas, to explore you know, cutting edge ideas about where innovative ideas come from and critically to then give you the tools to help you turn those ideas into reality. And so the final set of thoughts I want to share with you it's really about this issue about how do we make innovation happen. You know, there's two very, very simple and almost diametrically opposite views on change. You know, one is that change has to be driven from the top. We need a chief executive and his or her management team to take ownership and to take responsibility for making sure that change happens. And when I say change, of course, this can be innovative change, it can be cost-cutting change, there's lots of different types of change. The other view says that change happens in a bottom-up way because the chief executive is often a little bit far removed from the real kind of cutting edge things that are happening in the world. So, you know, if you want change to happen, you are relying on your frontline people. You're relying on the people who are out there in the marketplace, seeing what users need, seeing the problems that are faced and coming up with solutions to those problems. And so, of course, both of these views have some merits. The reality, in my experience, is always some combination of the two. Uh, you can see that little image on the right, uh, Scaling Up Excellence. It's a book by a, a couple of really good, good academics at Stanford, a couple of friends of mine, Bob Sutton and Huggy Rao. Um, they do a very good job of talking about how you take something which works in one place and scale it up across an organization. The angle I just want to play up a little bit more now, though, is, is the following, which is this, this idea of how do we take bottom-up change, or at least change which happens in the middle of an organization, and how do we ensure that it actually makes a difference across the organization? Uh, and of course, one of the reasons that, that often doesn't happen is that a successful initiative in some part of the organization often gets sort of skeptically looked at, distrusted almost by those in other parts of the organization. They say, well, how can this help us? How is this going to work? You know, I didn't buy into that. It's the sort of not invented here syndrome. I'm just going to give you a brief example. It's a, it's a UK example. So for those of you who live or, or have ever lived in the, the UK, um, if you want to buy any government services at all online, you go to the government website, gov.uk. And this is a story about a chap called Mike Bracken, who has uh, spearheaded over the last five years or so the dramatic transformation of the government's digital services, all of the websites provided by the government in order to make life as a user, as a citizen, a little bit a little bit simpler. Uh, and the reason this is an interesting story, I'm just going to give you the kind of punchline, is he knows full well how difficult it is to get anything done in the world of government, in the world of public sector. And so his strategy was what he called delivery. The strategy's delivery means I'm not going to come up with a big policy paper. I'm not going to try to get everybody to buy into a strategy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make stuff happen. And using agile software development techniques, he actually basically created a whole bunch of pilots across all sorts of departments of government, whereby they changed the websites, they made them work, they got user buy-in, and they used that as a wedge, as a tool, to then persuade others in the organization of government to buy in. Now, he had a bit of air cover, he had a bit of support from a couple of well-known people, Francis Maud, who is the cabinet secretary, and a lady called Martha Lane Fox, who uh, is a very famous sort of dot-com entrepreneur in the UK. They provided coverage for him. But the key point is, and really the takeaway from this little story, is that if you want to get done in, stuff done in organizations, particularly big organizations, 
getting things done and making things happen and then using that as a vehicle to get the, the bandwagon rolling is the best way forward in my experience. So there are lots of principles here. I'm not going to go through these in any detail. We're, we're going to run out of time otherwise. But there's lots of basic principles that anybody in a mid-level position in a big organization can put in place to, to take their ideas, the things that they're playing with, and the ideas that they're grappling with, to link them up to a bigger agenda, to get support, to pick the right battles, to experiment, and to, to move those things forward, and gradually to build support for them. And so one of the things we're, we're absolutely going to cover in this course is some of the the practical ways that anybody can really take their own ideas whether they've got a hot lot of support or not and move them forward so i'm going to finish there i mean there's a bunch of different elements to the to the course that we're offering in june um including obviously myself and a couple of other faculty we're going to give people a an innovation challenge uh we're going to give them opportunity to work through their own ideas and to sort of push them and challenge them along the way there. We've also got various guest speakers and a visit to the, to the UK so-called Design Council, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to move now to, to Q&A. Uh, what we've done is we've collected up your questions that you've been asking along the way. And I'm going to answer some of them, because obviously there's no way I can answer them all. Um, so I'm just going to pick, more or less at random, uh, three or four questions. Uh, one question says, how does Julian feel about applying user research as a validation tool? Given the idea that users don't know what could be, but can validate a good idea that solves a user need. Uh, and of course, yes, I think that is a terrific idea. Um, nice, to see, nice to meet you again, Philip. Uh, I'm, I've met Philip before. Um, so yes, we need to come up with ideas uh, through a, a creative process. But once we've got those ideas, we can absolutely take them back to prospective users, both current customers as well as people who are not currently buying our products or service but might want to buy them in the future. And we can say to them, what do you think of this? Now, they, they don't always get it right. Sometimes people still can't see the potential benefits of, a, of an iPhone or whatever it is. But certainly as a way of validating and sense-checking our crazy ideas, it can be useful. Another question. Uh, what are the critical milestones to be achieved between an initial idea generation and its actual market access? What are the traps on this journey? So what I described in with those three lenses was um, was really the very first stage of what's often called a stage gate process, the idea generation stage. And in and most big companies have a version of a stage gate process where the original generation of the ideas then leads to typically three or four filters or screens or validation mechanisms before that idea is given you know the thumbs up and the serious investment and so typically there will be an initial test to say is this idea technologically feasible can we actually do it there will be a step that says you know do, do customers actually want to buy it now we don't always get that right as we said but we can get some initial validation as to whether there seems to be some customer interest. And then you'd have a question about, you know, a bunch of kind of technical questions about, you know, do we own the intellectual property? Um, you know, are competitors doing something similar? And then you'd have a big one around, is the business model make sense? In other words, you know, we know it works, we know customers want it, but can we actually make money out of it? Now, I sketched that out really in brief. There's lots and lots of material out there on thinking through these processes in some detail. Um, the key point, of course, is that each stage along the way, you know, you're going to kill off a bunch of these potentially promising ideas. And typically, you know, for every, you know, 10 ideas you develop, you're only going to get one or two, make it all the way through the process. Um, so I see a question, is it adapting an idea enough to be a successful entrepreneur? Absolutely yes. In other words, you know, some people think that to be an entrepreneur or to be an innovator, you've got to do something kind of ground-shakingly creative. And nothing could be further from the truth. You know, an entrepreneur, in my definition, or put it this way, an entrepreneurship is the pursuit of, a pursuit of opportunity without regard to the resources you control. In other words, entrepreneurs are simply people who have seen an opportunity, have an idea, wherever they've got it from, and they pursue it by 
corralling people to help them and by sort of building the resources to make it happen. And so if you just nick your idea from somebody else, legally of course, then that still makes you an entrepreneur. Um, a couple more questions. Um, thanks for the presentation. Can you create conditions for an agile way of working, allowing for tests leading to innovations? Um, yes, enormously long answer I could give to that question. But let me just make the, the shortcut, which is that you know most big organizations have developed processes and mechanisms and, uh, that are all kind of designed to weed out failure. In other words, they're designed to sort of reward conservatism and the status quo. So big companies have to work very hard to create the agility to allow all of this stuff to happen. You know, a big part of it is taking a look at the bureaucracy, the, the processes, the tools that they're using, and saying, are these too heavy handed? Could we actually create much lighter touch tools around our budgeting processes and resource allocation and so forth? I see a lot of companies, for example, experimenting with these so-called lean or beyond budgeting methodologies. Um, can you comment, somebody says, on the relevance of net ethnicity and culture and corporate culture and creating environments for innovation? So again, there's lots we could say here, and I think this may be my last answer in the interest of staying roughly on schedule. But uh, the question, question I raised is a fascinating issue around culture. Culture is the kind of collective programming of the mind. It's the way we, we do things around here. And of course, you can identify corporate cultures. You know, Apple is very different from Google, which is very different from London Business School. You can also identify national cultures. You know, the UK culture is different from the Chinese culture, is different from the Indian culture. Uh, you know, these are very broad generalizations, but there are some absolutely some true sort of stereotypes of different types of cultures. It's very hard to answer this question in a short time, but let me just make one quick observation, which is that, you know, most of what I've said so far, you know, is from my, my own background, sort of an Anglo-American background, if you see what I mean. And of course, Britain, America, Canada, Australia, these are all countries with a very strong individualistic streak and, and a relatively, relatively low kind of hierarchical kind of norms. Many countries in the world, you can look at France, you can look at South Korea, Japan, you can look at uh, China. Uh, we see much, much less of that. We see mo much more collectivism, we, uh, much more kind of concern for the collective rather than the individual. We see much greater power distance between the top and bottom of society. And it's actually much harder in many of these cases for innovation to work successfully. So an awful lot of companies in, a, in a Japan or South Korea, for example, really struggle with, for example, bottom-up innovation. They're very good at incremental innovation, but they struggle a lot more with the more radical forms of innovation. There are at least four or five other questions that I'd love to answer, but I'm conscious that it is 11 o'clock. So I'm going to suggest that we close this down. By all means, keep sending your questions, and we'll, we'll try to write some brief answers to some of the ones that, that we haven't answered verbally. Uh, what I'll just do to close, in case you're interested, I mean, uh, some of you have just tuned in just to, to get a few ideas, which hopefully have been useful. Some of you have tuned in because you might have an interest in this program that we're offering. So let me just give you the dates. The next time the Making Innovation Happen program occurs is 22nd, 26th of June this year. There's another one also in November. As I say, I'm the program director of that program. I'm with you throughout that program, but a couple of my faculty colleagues and guest speakers are also speaking as part of it. One final observation, the program director, the person who really coordinates the entire thing, Tim Sylvester, will be giving us a bit more of an overview of the program itself in terms of the nuts and bolts of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can see at the bottom of that slide there an opportunity to register for that uh, brief webinar from Tim. And so please, by all means, uh, register for that if you've got some interest in, in taking part in the program on in June or November. So that's it. Hopefully that was useful. I apologize for talking so quickly, but I realize we've all got busy days. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. By all means, send me a note if you've got any follow-up questions. Uh, you can find my email very easily there. Um, and I wish you every success in your innovation endeavors. Goodbye.